as a hospital system um, since 1985. Uh, we are considered uh, a, a regional center of excellence for uh, both cardiac surgery and cardiovascular intervention. And we uh, run a very robust institute uh, for medical research called the Lankanal Institute for Medical Research, where all of our clinical work uh, in new technologies uh, emerges. I'm going to speak to you today about two different uh, therapeutic subjects. The first one is left atrial appendage with a novel device, the conformal device. Um, and the second is going to be all of our tricuspid valve uh, initi initiatives in the space of tricuspid valve regurgitation. So without further ado, I'm going to speak to you first about the uh, class uh, device, which is a novel conformable foam-based implant for left atrial appendage closure. And it's from the conformal company. And we're going to re reflect on the conformal EFS, the early feasibility experience. I'm going to take a moment to talk about what the early feasibility experience means. In the United States, the FDA has um, understood that we need to be more welcoming to new technology. Uh, much of the new technology that was developed in the early de earlier decades uh, was, was taken outside the United States and the initial um, research was done there and, and the FDA wanted to bring it back into the United States. So as a, as a function of that, they developed the early feasibility uh, study pathway. And that means that uh, new technologies have never been in human beings before could actually do that work in the United States. We at Lankanaw are one of about a dozen sites in the United States. It's a very exclusive group of sites that are allowed to participate in the early feasibility study experiences. Um, and that's because our clinical outcomes are excellent and our research data collection is also very, very good. So the early feasibility study experience here is going to reflect on uh, four or five different sites in the country. Um, and I'm gonna report on that because actually I'm the national principal investigator for the entire uh, study. So before we get too far down the road, um, I want to talk a little bit about Watchman device, because this is really the, the, the thing that came before the conformal device. As, as all of you know, at least in the United States, uh, atrial fibrillation is extremely uh, common and over the age of 65 occurs regu uh, pretty regularly. Um, unfortunately, uh, one out of five strokes in the United States is related to uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, recurrent stroke after initial stroke is very, very common. Uh, as you all know, uh, we score these types of patients in atrial, chronic atrial fibrillation with the CHADS-VASC score. And the CHADS-VASC score allows us to look at the relative risk of stroke, not on anticoagulation therapy. Um, most people who are CHADS-VASC two or greater would be uh, candidates for uh, warfarin or DOAC uh, anticoagulation therapy. And we, but the problem with that is that although we know that warfarin and, and novel DOAX work very well to prevent stroke and really reduce stroke rates down to about one and a half percent per year, which is quite good compared to the typical five to 6% per year in atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, many of the patients who take uh, or are supposed to take anticoagulants don't. And this is again in the United States published uh, about four or five years ago, showing the fact that uh, many patients uh, were not taking the appropriate type of anticoagulation therapy, actually less than 50%, which means the rest of the 50% are at risk for uh, stroke. And we also know that patients on morphine therapy are only in therapeutic range somewhere between 50 and 65% of the time. So they're at risk some percentage of the time as well. Even patients who are started on uh, NOAC therapies, unfortunately, stop taking the drug because of side effects or bleeding uh, after two years, uh, we about 30% of patients who should be on these anticoagulants don't take them. So the Watchman device uh, comes along and it's an, uh, an implantable um, uh, device which is put into the left atrial appendage through a transeptal puncture. Um, and it's been around actually for almost uh, 15 to 25 year, 20 years uh, in certain uh, studies and uh, early experiences. Um, it's, it was recently approved in the United States about five years ago, and uh, there are over 100,000 implants now worldwide uh, with this device. And the device works pretty well. You can see here the, the drawing of what it's supposed to look like after it's placed into the uh, left atrial appendage. Here we have uh, echocardiographic views of the various uh, 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 echocardiographic uh, projections. 
and we see a well-seated device, which has now obliterated the atrial appendage, which would have been in this area here. So this is this, and we know that uh, the data are quite good for this device, um, but we, uh, in terms of stroke prevention, but we also know that at least in the early going, there was a lot of complications in the implantation and that had to do with the way the device was implanted. There was a, a series of prongs that, that, that were used to uh, exit the catheter and perforation of the, of the cardiac chambers was not uncommon. That has clearly gotten better over time. And the most recent data from the Evolution trial in Europe uh, about four years ago also suggests that it's, um, it's a tolerable rate of complication. But we believe we can do better than that. And I'll show you why in a moment. Um, but this is really why we're talking about the subject, because when you look as compared to warfarin at the outcomes uh, for uh, stroke and bleeding, you see that the advantage really goes to Watchman. Hemorrhagic stroke is markedly reduced, fatal and disabling stroke markedly reduced, and unexplained death or cardiovascular death is also reduced uh, at four or five years. This is really remarkable. We don't do many things in cardiovascular medicine that actually uh, make people live longer. This is likely related to the absence of stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so all around, it's a good technology, but we believe we can do better. And this is the uh, device we're going to be talking about today. This is the class implant. Again, an early visibility investigational device exemption and first in human experience. And you're going to hear about that today. Um, it's a four center single arm study. So everybody got the device and it was for, to assess safety and uh, possible efficacy. Uh, the reason this device has such promise is because as compared to the watchman, which had all those prongs, this device is covered in a foam shield which allows it to be very safely exited from the catheter with a bumper and very difficult to actually injure the myocardial, the, uh, myocardial surface. So in addition to that, it has the usual uh, anchor barb system. You can see them here. And it has a, a Gore-Tex uh, covering, which allows for uh, rapid healing. Uh, most people know that EPTFE Gore-Tex uh, has a lot of, many biological uses, and this is a very consistent material uh, in use. It should also reduce the incidence of thrombosis. And also in an effort to reduce thrombosis, there's no screw here, which is present in the Watchman device. Uh, it actually has a tether. And so there's nothing sticking out that's going to uh, allow for thrombus formation. So a, a second generation device. Uh, interestingly, although the Watchman device has at least six uh, sizes, this device actually only has two sizes, small, regular, and large. And um, not only does it have just two devices so that the, the distinction or the nuance of putting one in is quite is much uh, reduced, but we also have um, uh, a very low sh uh, shallow landing zone. So you can have a 35 millimeter device with only a 10 millimeter landing zone, which put, gives it a huge advantage because many of these difficult to treat uh, atrial appendages are very shallow. And so this again has another advantage, uh, two sizes, less equipment on the shelf uh, and more uh, ability to close more difficult anatomies. And as I mentioned before, here's the tether uh, in the top of the device, which allows uh, for uh, no cable attachment. And we talked about all the devices uh, attributes here. This is what it looks like in a, a pig, um, a model uh, and histologic evaluation. And you can see, and this is the other thing that I really love about this device, as compared to Watchman, which really requires a more or less coaxial placement of the device, this device can go in in any fashion you want because it's really a plug and any part of the surface that touches the uh, left atrial appendage will, will seal the surface and engage it for um, security. So here you see an off axis implantation, but it doesn't matter. The device seals well and the appendage is, is obliterated. So another advantage of this device. Here's a quick movie uh, showing the implantation of the device. Uh, first, we put a transeptal sheath across with a pigtail catheter in, which allows us to gain access and imaging of left atrial appendage. Uh, thereafter, the device is advanced into the tip of the sheath. That foam soft tip is, is then pushed out. There's no barbs there and then deployed into position in the left atrial appendage. Here's an actual procedure from our uh, institution, uh, a difficult case because of the shallow um, uh, depth of left atrial appendage. 
Here's what it looks like on echocardiography. Another difficult aspect is it was very uh, oblong, a very oval shape. And uh, here's what it looks like uh, when we measure it at 28 millimeters. And so this would be a, a large device. Uh, here it is being implanted. And notice I don't have to do anything too fancy to put this device in, it goes in very nicely. It's still tethered there, but occlusive. And if we look now at our angiography, we see a nicely occluded vessel here. I'm sorry, nicely occluded uh, actual appendage. We see an excellent uh, appearance on the echocardiogram here without any leak whatsoever on duplex evaluation. And on 3D echo, again, it may be off axis, which is fine, but it seals beautifully. So the promise of the device was fulfilled uh, in a case like this. And here's what the same procedure looks like in 45 days. We see nice endothelial co coating without any evidence of thrombus. So I'm gonna go forward here. I just, I do wanna talk about the res procedure results. So we've enrolled 22 patients in this trial. We're about to restart this trial. There was a modification to the delivery system, but not to the device. And um, that's going to allow us to, um, to proceed with this. And actually later this year, we're gonna start a pivotal trial uh, comparing this device to Watchman in about 1400 patients. Uh, you can see that we had 22 enrolled patients. We had 18 <clears throat> patients actually received the device. Four of them were too large for the regular implant. And we did not have the large implant until later in the experience. So it's not reflected here. Um, and you can see that the CHAS-VASC was high, no procedural complications. Uh, Follow-up is listed here, 20 patients at uh, 45 days, and at one year we have four patients, six months, 15. Left atrial diameters, left atrial appendage diameters were about 20 millimeters. We used mostly regular, as I mentioned, we didn't have a large until the end. We had uh, two leaks. Uh, we had one inc inconsequential leak at one millimeter, and then we had a, unfortunately, uh, one of our operators missed a lobe, and so I wouldn't call that a leak, really. It was just a, a deeply implanted device that, that we should probably shouldn't have put in there. There was one device related thrombus that resolved without sequelae. So for an early experience and a first in human, it was an excellent outcome. There were no strokes. And as compared to Watchman, uh, you can see that uh, the Watchman device actually, uh, you can shoot contrast through it. So it makes it difficult to assess for leak. When you look at the, uh, our device, because of the EPTFE covering, uh, you can see that uh, there's no leaks here, but there's also no, you don't have to figure out what's happening with contrast going through the top. So that's another advantage of the device. I say, okay, so in conclusions, the conformal class EFS study shows that um, the, the device has shown feasibility and safety. Uh, TE shows uh, very good conformability with very good sealing results. Only two sizes addressed most of the range of left atrial appendage anatomies. And as I mentioned before, the pivotal trial will start later this year. We're excited to be the principal investigator for that trial. Uh, it's going to be an international global trial uh, looking at this device. So with that, I'm going to, uh, with that, I'm going to end um, that, st that uh, slide presentation. And I'm going to move into our presentation for um, tricuspid valve disease. Because I think in addition to the, this is the other EFS early feasibility study uh, suite of trials that we're doing. And I think it's quite important that we talk about this. Um, so the title of this talk is The Future is Nearer Than You Think, and it's Novel Non-Surgical Therapies for Tricuspid Regurgitation. Interestingly, when, the, when we first landed on the moon about the same time, uh, Drs. Ross, Brunwald, and uh, Morrow said that about tricuspid regurgitation that in many patients with advanced mitral valve disease, associated tricuspid regurgitation is a functional nature and secondary to the right ventricular hypertension and dilation of the tricuspid annulus. The present results indicate that in such patient, tricuspid regurgitation will improve or disappear after mitral replacement and tricuspid valve replacement is seldom necessary. In fact, that was very wrong. I'm gonna show you why in a moment. Here's, the, um, here, here's something we don't talk a lot about. We know a lot about aortic valve disease. We're learning a lot about mitral valve disease. Certainly for aortic stenosis, we know that the Braunwald curve, Braunwald Ross curve after a year and a half or two from the onset of symptoms, patients will have significant uh, mortality. But what we don't talk about are the regurgitant lesions in mit mitral and tricuspid disease. And I wanna focus here on tricuspid, functional tricuspid, which is really 
about 90% of all the tricuspid valve disease um, in terms of uh, regurgitation is functional. And if you look at functional um, uh, tricuspid disease by severity of grade, trivial through severe, and you look at the, the actual survival rates, you see that trivial functional is really kind of the normative standard and about six, 60 to 70% of patients will survive to 10 years. However, if you do uh, in similar patients and look at the mild, moderate, and severe functional tricuspid regurgitation, you see a steep drop off in survival. And this doesn't speak even to the amount of um, the severity of illness, the quality of life reduction, the number of hospitalizations and the number of medications that have to be taken just to survive this long. So it's a miserable survival. As we all know, a lot of swelling, bloating. Sometimes we get venous ulcers. Um, it's a real problem. Uh, lots of fatigue and lots of shortness of breath. So this just shows how bad uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation can be. It's easy to, like Braunwald did in uh, 67, it's easy to say, well, that's just because of right ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. And in point of fact, it doesn't matter whether you have pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular dysfunction, the survival is affected specifically by the degree of, fun of functional tricuspid regurgitation. So important uh, to recognize that, that it's, a, it's a severe disease. Unfortunately, we don't see, at least in the United States, much in the way of surgical repair. There's only 10,000 tricuspid valve surgeries and uh, isolated tricuspid valve surgery is fairly unusual. Surgery is done with either bands or rings, like in here, uh, or uh, in here, sorry, uh, or valve replacements. And um, that's all well and good. The problem with it is, and the reason that we don't do a lot of tricuspid valve surgery is that the mortality rates uh, have been not good. So even over the last uh, 15 years or so, you can see that in hospital uh, mortality is about 8%. And uh, really, that's quite that's quite you know uh, significant. Um, if you look at tricuspid valve replacement and repair, you see that <clears throat> excuse me, replacement actually does a little worse than repair, and that may be related to the fact that a, a non-repairable valve may be further along and worse off from a right ventricular standpoint. Um, there are there are uh, multiple components to the tricuspid valve. I want to establish those to now, and then we'll talk about some of the relationships in a minute. Um, because as we move away from surgery and it's percutaneous, these things become important. Um, this is the annulus of the tricuspid valve. I will tell you that if you look at a cat cadaveric uh, model of the tricuspid valve, the annulus is not a very rigid or fibrous structure. It almost runs right through the the right atrium through the into the right ventricle. And um, but it's not a very solid structure. And I'll, I'll show why that's important in a moment. Obviously, it has three leaflets. Uh, it has the same chordae tendinae and papillary muscles that um, the mitral valve does, but it's, it does not have a chordal free zone. What I mean by that is in the mitral valve, you have uh, A2 and P2, which tend to be chordal free zones, and you can clip them or repair them. But in this uh, valve, the cords run everywhere, and that can sometimes be challenging for edge-to-edge uh, -edge repairs. Okay, so what happens that causes tricuspid regurgitation and functional uh, TR? Well, the septal leaflet here is really anchored to the uh, interventricular septum, and it does not really move. But the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet, which are attached to the right free, ventricular, free right ventricular wall, actually do move out with, uh, with uh, things like chronic atrial fibrillation, dilation of anglis, um, pressure overload, volume overload, and so on. And so what ends up happening is the valve gets pulled apart in the anterior and posterior direction where the septum actually stays relatively fixed. Any edge-to-edge -edge repair then cannot be done between the posterior and anterior leaflet because they're, they're not going to, they're not anchored, they don't serve as anchors. Every repair really has to have a septal posterior or an anterior septal orientation to bring those leaflets back into position and pull the annulus uh, and reduce its overall size. In addition to the leaflet motion, the, the plane of the valve actually changes as well. It's usually a saddle shaped valve, much like the mitral valve, but over time, uh, the valve actually becomes flattened out and that'll become relevant here in a moment. 
So I'm not going to read through this, but it's important to recognize that there are things that occur progressively in mitral valve, and sorry, in tricuspid valve disease that may or may, 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 or may not allow for uh, repair or replacement. So when we get to the severe range, we start to see that leaflet coaptation becomes abnormal. Uh, into the severe and torrential ranges, we see that gaps uh, between the valve leaflets become significantly bigger. Uh, tethering, that is the valve doesn't lie flat anymore. It doesn't come together and coap like this, but it actually starts to be tethered into the right ventricle. And with increasing right ventricular enlargement and, dis and dysfunction, the tethering becomes more prominent. And you can see that the tethering is directly related to the dysfunction and remodeling of the right ventricle. So uh, from an anatomic standpoint, these changes in the tricuspid valve will determine some of the success and failure of a specific percutaneous devices we may want to <coughs> look at. A couple other notes about the tricuspid valve is that the right coronary artery runs in the AV groove, as we all know, and as a result runs right along the, right, the uh, tricuspid valve annulus and the anterior and posterior uh, sections. In the septal leaflet, there's no, uh, there's no vessel, obviously. For the um, right ventricular outflow tract, happily, uh, there's no real problem with uh, tricuspid valve leaflet uh, obstruction like there would be for mitral valve leaflet obstruction in the aortic outflow tract because the, um, the width and distance from the outflow tract uh, prevent that from happening. So replacement is not encumbered by uh, these tricuspid valve relationships to the outflow tract. Um, as relates to uh, conduction uh, uh, issues in coronary sinus, you can see that, uh, for instance, when we start to do cardioband, and I'll show you that in a moment, uh, we start here and we work cardioband all the way around the tricuspid valve, and we want to make sure that we get at least some of that cardioband onto the septal leaflet. This is a hard attachment zone. It's very solid, as is this. So if we can get attachment here and here, we can then cinch the band down. But we don't want to go too far and get into the AV, AV node or the bundle hiss. And our marker really is to try to get past the coronary sinus, uh, but not too far past the middle of the septal leaflet, which will be our kind of marker zone for the conduction system. At this point, we really haven't had difficult, difficulty with that, uh, but it's something we always look out for. So what's the tricuspid landscape look like in 2020? I, I, it's 2021, I understand, but I, I put this up here because this is the latest uh, information we have. Um, these are the, uh, the surgical predicates here, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what's going on in the tricuspid percutaneous um, uh, uh, comparison. So for direct suture annuloplasty, uh, these are the three techniques that are used. Um, the K bicuspidization, where the, the valve is actually sewn shut at the, at the commissure and, um, and the leaflets are co-opted that way. Uh, there's the Hertzer um, uh, uh, kind of uh, clover leaf. And in mimicking those, the trialine device um, is able to do some of the same co uh, K annuloplasty and the pasta device, uh, some of this type of um, of uh, clover leaf, but these these devices right now are not in widespread study. Uh, they've had difficulty in uh, gaining a foothold. Direct ring annuloplasty, which is what the surgeon will typically do, is mimicked by the cardioband, uh, the millipede, the davingi. So these devices will actually intend to bring the 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 uh, annulus. Uh, down and smaller and co op the leaflets that way. co optation enhancement, which is another way of saying edge-to-edge -edge repair, can be done with the mitral clip or tri-clip or the Pascal device. We're going to go into these. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of other of these which aren't, <clears throat> aren't around anymore, actually. And then we have valve replacement, and I'll be talking about that in a moment as well. So this is a device that's no longer in study. Uh, this is the former device. It was a clever device, uh, accessed through the, uh, th through the left um, subclavian vein, uh, runs in through the valve, and then ap apically attached uh, with an anchor hook system. And the device was, uh, was positioned in the mitral valve so as to, to provide a place for the valve to co-opt onto. So if there was a, a co-optation gap, this was a spacer that actually filled the gap 
and actually caused regurgitation to go, get a lot better. And it did work when it worked. The problem was that this, this attachment was not secure and we had, saw a lot of detachments um, and there was no real easy way to figure out how to fix that. So this device is no longer uh, being studied and uh, not investigated even um, at the uh, Edward Life Sciences. Um, before I go into some of the specific data, I do wanna talk about a trivalve registry which is an early experience of all the devices that were available, collected up, not controlled, not correlated, controlled, but just a reported experience. And I think it's an important one to reflect on. <clears throat> you can see that most of the experience was the MitraClip, if that was really the only thing that was available. Um, and there's a smattering of other devices here. And you can see that um, as a proof of concept, the percutaneous uh, tricuspid regurgitation reduction can be achieved. You can see that four plus TR goes to, uh, from 60 to two thirds of the patients to less than one fifth of the patients. And uh, se uh, severe uh, TR uh, goes from a third to about a fifth. So this is a proof of concept that was critically important as we start to look forward uh, to future percutaneous devices. The other thing that's interesting to note is that the uh, patients who did not get a procedural success, that is they continued to have tricuspid regurgitation, they served as really controls for this trial. Now notice, notice the numbers are very small here. Nevertheless, patients who had significant procedural success did better overall in terms of survival, significantly better, uh, than patients who failed uh, to get the TR uh, reduced. So again, a proof of concept that you can do this procedure uh, safely and with significant efficacy. Um, I should mention that the, the safety of this procedure has been really quite remarkable, especially as compared to the eight or 9% surgical mortality, in-hospital mortality. Okay, so this is the Abbott vascular triclip. Uh, this is a procedure being done. You can see here's a, a transgastric view uh, looking at uh, severe leakage. This is the septal leaflet here. This is the posterior leaflet here. Sorry, an yeah, posterior leaflet. No, sorry, anterior leaflet here, posterior leaflet here. And um, you can see the leaflet, uh, the regurgitation occurs uh, between both anterior and septal and posterior and septal. And um, once you, once you uh, implant the, the uh, mitral clip, you can see marked reduction in overall regurgitation, which will be coming back this way. This is a tra uh, uh, transthoracic echo. You can see that quite nicely demonstrated. So in the United States today, uh, the trilumina pivotal trial has already been started and um, we're hopeful that this will be successful. The tricuspid clip, and I'm not gonna go through all these, but you'll see these types of graphs throughout my talk, which is that regardless of the device we're talking about, they all reduce uh, TR significantly, and they all have significant safety profile, and they all have better um, quality of life as measured by the KCCQ, that's the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, and the um, SF36 tool. So this is an important uh, development for many of our patients. Okay, so the Edwards Pascal device is a device that we're currently uh, using at Lankanaw Medical Center and Lankanaw Heart Institute. This is a, uh, a similar device to the uh, MitraClip, except that this device is a little wider and has paddles, uh, which a little uh, grab a little more tissue and may be a little softer on the valve. Uh, this device in its natural state wants to be closed. It's a nitinol uh, spring-loaded device. <clears throat> the MitraClip has to be screwed closed and that may, may or may not be an advantage. But we can see here significant tricuspid regurgitation, central jet, uh, wide orifice. You can see anterior septal and posterior leaflets here. And you can see the, the clasp device going in. Here it is, um, two of them, one anterior septal, one posterior septal. And you see the marked reduction in overall uh, regurgitation. I'm just going to skip through that. So this is the this actually was just published this week. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to say that we were part of this study. Um, you can see the uh, marked reduction in overall uh, uh, heart failure class uh, from most patients were about 80% of patients were class three heart failure or worse, and that goes to about 20%. And uh, there were no class one heart failure patients at the beginning of the trial. And at the end, in 63 patients, we see about a third of them actually go to class one heart failure and almost 90% of them are either class one or two. So a marked improvement in overall uh, uh, life um, 
experience. That's correlated with the tricuspid severity. <clears throat> Again, about 80% of the patients were either torrential, torrential or massive tri tricuspid regurgitation, which on a scale is uh, scale five and six out of six. And we see that at the end of the uh, study, uh, less than 20% of them, from 80% to 20%, uh, have a severe or torrential TR. So this is a very, very pleasing uh, result. And again, the safety profile of these devices is excellent. Next device I want to talk about is also uh, something we're doing at Lancome Medical Center, the Edwards Cardiband device. I went through this earlier in terms of its intent, which is to have an anchored band uh, of device placed in here. <clears throat> and then that band is then cinched down so that it clamps down on the, um, uh, the annulus and provides a significant reduction in overall um, tricuspid regurgitation and better co-optation. You can see as compared to this right upper panel, this right lower panel uh, shows significant reduction in overall TR. Um, I'm happy to say and honored to say that I'm the national principal investigator for this early feasibility study. And um, we're quite pleased with the results of the, out of the outcome of the study. Um, the annular reduction is achieved, as I mentioned before, through this uh, implant. Uh, the implant is actually put in by these screws and the screws have to be visualized. The location of the screws have to be visualized by uh, TEE or 4D intracardiac echo. It's a very difficult visualization. The tricuspid valve is far field from the, it's anterior and far field from the posterior TEE and the ice catheter can be very useful in certain aspects. So this is really all about imaging. The actual mechanics of moving the device are not difficult. Um, I'm gonna go forward. You're gonna see here, um, this is a before cinching, and then this is after cinching. You can see the difference in the, the circumference of the implanted band here. And I'm gonna point out the right ventricle, uh, sorry, the right coronary artery has been somewhat kinked uh, by the device. We know now that that kinking is almost entirely gone after 24 to 48 hours in follow-up angiography. And we believe that the tissue relaxes, the fatty tissue underneath the artery probably relaxes, allows for that kinking to <clears throat> go away. We have not had significant ischemic res uh, res results of that kind of vascular kinking. It doesn't happen in every case, but this is a good example of the type of things that we see. And unfortunately, I can't play these, but you can imagine that this annulus, which is now reduced significantly, has reduced also the, the tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, in the part of the, one of the planning things that we have to look at very closely is a CT uh, assessment of the, um, of the um, right coronary artery as relates to the tricuspid annulus. And here's a good example of where we want to make sure that our anchors are going to be free and clear of the right coronary artery. So these blue little cylinders are the anchors, and here's the right coronary artery on CT scan. This is a very good case, not any real interaction between the two, and no chance of perforation. This, this is another case where the cardioband would not be effective in its current iteration because the, uh, the angular size circumference is too long in the planning mode, and uh, that we don't have a device that can go that long. I will tell you that the, that the early feasibility trial has been halted while Edwards re-engineers larger devices and different uh, delivery systems for the device. Um, and once that's reestablished, we're gonna go back to the trial, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, would, and we'll be able to treat patients like this is my hope. We already talked about right coronary artery uh, kinking. I'm not gonna stay with that uh, here. Um, and I already talked about imaging. So here's the uh, tricuspid EFS outcome. Really remarkable, 96 out of, uh, uh, 27 out of 28 patients had no serious adverse events. Um, the one patient that did have an event had an RCA stent for severe kinking, uh, but didn't have any clinical outcome issues. Uh, the acute technical success, and this is you know, the first experience in the United States, quite good, only three patients had a problem with the device. One had an anchor detachment, one had a wire breakage, but 25 of them out of 28 did very well. And uh, we see that in almost all of the patients, there was a marked greater than 40% reduction 
and overall EROA. So this is again uh, a, an amazing result for uh, early ex uh, experience. And if you look at them on a uh, per patient basis, you can see similar outcomes in terms of paired analyses, septolateral diameters obviously reduced, and then we see um, that's as a as a paired analysis as well as paired differences here. And this is a, the European experience uh, because they had a little bit longer a head start. And we can see that the, both the P's of the vena contracta, the stroke volume, everything got better after cardioband uh, implantation. And this is sustained up to one year, which is again, quite remarkable. Remembering that one of the things that, that causes tricuspid regurgitation is tricuspid regurgitation. The more leakage you have, the more volume overload to the RV, the wider the the dilation becomes and the worse the tricuspid valve becomes. Once you reduce the tricuspid valve annulus, that cycle is broken and you actually can see uh, marked improvements in overall function and, and dimension. And again, so remarkable improvements in uh, quality of life. So we talked about this before. This is the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation. And the question becomes, is there a place where <clears throat> the therapies I've already talked to you about may not actually be possible because the gaps are too wide and you couldn't do edge to edge or the annulus is too big and you can't do an annual plasty? And the answer is yes. Um, and those things come, as I mentioned before, with increasing right ventricular dysfunction and dilation and ten tenting and tethering of the, the valve and annular dilatation and worsening TR. So in those patients, assuming there is decent right ventricular um, function still, uh, they may be good candidates for valve replacement. So at, at Lankanal Institute for Medical Research, we are doing the uh, Edwards Evoke tricuspid uh, valve replacement trial called the Tricen trial. This is the valve. It's been modified for the tricuspid implant. You can see these, uh, these little prongs will capture the uh, leaflets and the Cordae, it's implanted into the annulus, and then you will have this, is, and this is what it looks like on angiography uh, during implant. Um, we're very excited to get started on this. This is going to be a randomized trial looking at uh, this device versus optimal medical care. And uh, for patients who didn't qualify for the other two devices, either edge to edge or, um, leaf, or, or um, annular reduction, I, I, I'm very hopeful this will be uh, helpful to them. We've did, we did talk about this already. So I will finish by saying um, the, the take home messages really are that the functional tricuspid regurgitation is common and associated with a very poor prognosis. I showed that to you at the beginning of the slide set. The majority of the patients who have tricuspid regurgitation are not offered any intervention. And unfortunately they go so late until they're referred that we don't really have a, a lot of great options for them because the right ventricle is already blown out or their anatomy is no longer suitable. And so I would, I would say to you that if you have patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation early in the course of their clinical uh, setting that they should be considered for intervention. Patient selection and timing intervention uh, uh, are very important for all valvular interventions, especially tricuspid as we talked about just a moment ago. Most of these devices that I, that I went through are really developed to reproduce the surgical techniques that uh, many innovative, innovative devices will address. And uh, many of the mitral devices are actually being translated to, to tricuspid valve, but they're not, it's, they're not the same valve. The annulus are different. The uh, requirements are different in terms of what the, uh, the uh, chordae look like. And the mechanism is actually largely different. Most of these patients are functional, and most of these patients have that septal leaflet anchor with the anterior and posterior leaflet being dilated. So we know that, and lastly, that if you take torrential, and that's six on a scale of six, and take it down to severe, patients will significantly improve clinically. And that's remarkable because it really speaks to the volume and pressure overload these patients are experiencing at the time of, of our therapy. So I would say to you that <clears throat> If you can, uh, don't wait uh, to refer patients for a device implant or surgery because these devices may be more effective in less advanced sarcastic regurgitation patients. And with that, I'll end and uh, wish everybody a safe and healthy new year. And um, I appreciate the honor of being here to talk to you about these new technologies 
being offered at Lacoste Institute for Medical Research. Thank you. Thank you.